On my high school team, we had five guys make the NBA. We had the county rocking. It's the mecca of basketball. There are those who come before us upon whose shoulders we stand. It's nothing that you can do to stop a competitive edge. It's just in the water. Welcome back to a special quarantine edition. We got a real special guest. What's up with your Brody with the virtual handshake? I'm going to tell y'all something that I never told nobody. I want all the smoke. Welcome back to a special quarantine edition of All the Smoke. I'm coming to you from L.A., my brother Jackson, Atlanta. What's up, bro? My brother, good to see you, man. How you holding up? I know them boys tearing things up over there, man. But yeah, things starting man. To look, it's things starting to look a little better, though. We, I'm starting to see some bright days out here in Atlanta. They, yeah. they thinking about opening up things uh, starting Friday. I'm going to lay back a little bit, but yeah. it's good to see that things are, things are making progress. See, that scares me. I kind of think that's a catch-22. Obviously, I want the world to open back up, but I don't know if we're ready for it. And, you know, with this administration, it's all about business and money, not really preserving lives. So I'm a little skeptical on the opening up as much as I want to see the world open back up. I don't really know if we're ready yet. But, yeah, no, the boys are in here. I was just telling Steve before we got going, the boys are in here doing their online homework, supposedly, in the next room. But I keep hearing balls bouncing. Then I'll hear fucking one kid throwing on the floor yelling. I'm just like, there's no part of homework that has <laughs> that kind of shit going on. Basketball in it. Right, I guess so. Hey, but it's, it's funny you say that because out here, our governor is saying, let everybody come out, let's get the city back rolling, but our mayor is telling people to stay home. No, so what are we right. supposed to think? You know what I'm saying? Stay home. Yeah. At least it's sunny, though. Sun, sun brings a lot of hope. Right. But anyway, man, we have an amazing guest today, uh, a former teammate of mine, one of the greatest point guards ever to play, a 2018 Hall of Fame inductee. Without further ado, mm. man, uh, welcome Steve Nash. Steve, welcome. Thanks, Thanks for bro. having me, boys. Uh, Appreciate thanks going for coming on the show, on, my man. boy. Yeah. How's everything? We were talking a little bit offline. You said you got five kids in the house. Uh, how's that going? I mean, it's it's been you know the the positive twin fifteen year old girls and the, you know it, it, teenagers you know they love to just revert to their phones. So the positive has been like two three hours a day. We'll all hang out as a family. And then there's like that 25% of the day where it's either like, I need a drink or I'm going to jump out a window. This is, <laughs> this is, this is crazy. So, but we're surviving. What are the ages? Because I know the youngest is two, yeah. right? No, the youngest so nine months. No, so we, uh, so I have the three big kids. Lola and Bella are 15. Mm -hmm. Mateo, Mateo's nine now. Third grade. Okay. Luca's, Luca's two and a half. And then little baby Ruby's, okay. uh, what's she's about nine Nine and a half months now, so I, I got Man. them all. I got all all ages, all yeah. shapes Congrats. and sizes. Thank you. Ruby's a beautiful name too. I like Ruby. That's a beautiful name. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my wife chose it, but I like it. Well, let's get going, man. Congratulations again on your Hall of Fame induction in 2018. You know, coming from where you came from, minimal college scholarship offers to be named to the Hall of Fame. What did that mean to you? It meant a lot. I mean. Uh, you know, I was a, I was a kid who had one scholarship offer. You know, Santa Clara, that was right. it, or else I was going to stay in Canada and play college basketball there. You know, somehow it all worked out and in the end. But for, for me to, to be in the Hall of Fame, be recognized for the hard work, to be in the company of all those great players is, is definitely special. And, uh, you know, something that, uh, I, you know, it was a moment in time that kind of like put a, put a bow on the whole thing, right? Starting out playing when I was 13. Yeah. You know, making my way through high school, college pros, and, and continuing to push. And I think, you know, it was just a nice kind of uh, closure to, to what was an amazing experience of being able to play this game that I love for as long as I did. 18 years, man, that's a long, long yes, time. You know, yes, 18, getting a chance to play with you that one year in Phoenix, I just saw how serious, obviously, you kept body prep maintaining your body, doing everything you possibly could to keep your body in tip-top shape, nutritionally, physically. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that approach because, I mean, for people who don't know, who haven't ran across you, you're not that big, and you were playing against Giants your whole <laughs> career and doing a great job at it. So talk to us about your, uh, your you. mental, physical preparation to, 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 to have that he kind of He was just crafty. He, he had Very. to be crafty. Crafty. That's another word for white. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was I, I, I was I was hella white too, but uh, you know I think um, 
you know, for me, I was obsessed with the game. Uh, fell in love with it as a, as a teenager. Played it uh, obviously all the time. Somehow got that one scholarship offer. You know, somehow got myself in the in the draft in the first round. And you know, probably most people still thought maybe a backup you know, career backup, maybe a starter, and just just never took my foot off the gas, just worked and worked and worked every single day, you know, stacked days and weeks and years on top of each other and just continue to develop. You know, I went, it's it's strange to think now, but I went four years to Santa Clara. So, um, you know, came into the league at 22, played 18 years, retired at 40, and probably had my best years, you know, in my 30s. So, you know, for me, I was, uh, I would say, a uh, uh, a late bloomer. I uh, was had to catch up physically to the level of the NBA, um, and then when I was thirty and I'd reached kind of my peak, it was about maintaining and trying to allow my body to play as long as I could. So I was always looking for every advantage, whether that be physical training, conditioning, recovery, um, uh, being smart about the way I continue to sharpen my skills and put myself in the best physical condition to perform, but not overdoing it, not underdoing it, finding that right balance. And then, right. you know, I just tried to look right. for those advantages in sleep, uh, diet, um, you know, physical therapy, whatever it may be, physical stuff, because, you know, I need it. I mean, I, it comes down to one, having a passion to do it. Like I had an absolute passion and competitive mm -hmm. nature to want to compete, want to be out there, want to play as long as I could. And so when you have that passion, you're willing to make sacrifices. And so I was willing to make sacrifices, willing to learn, um, looking into all sorts of different ways that I could recover or perform or whatever it may be. So, yeah, it started with a passion and then a curiosity and then just continued to dial it in. And fortunately, was able to play through my 30s. Mm. Hey, no, nobody, a lot of people don't know, Steve, that you was my vet for a couple weeks. Until That's I got right. cut. He yeah. said a couple I mean, weeks. You know what, though? Was, <laughs> I got drafted if, by the Suns, man. I got drafted by the yeah, Suns. Yeah, I remember. I remember. And, I but remember. But you know, you know what? It feels like way more than a couple weeks because weren't we there like all summer? Yes, we were working out there all summer. Yeah. So like we were, we might have only spent like two or three weeks as teammates, but we were, you know, we were worked out all summer together. And, and man, that was fun. We had a, had a great time and. You know, getting to know you and being two younger guys, trying to trying to make a name for ourselves, uh, spending that summer working out with you is something I'll never forget. Hey, but I, I tell people this all the time, Steve, and I said it on this show before, and it's something that you told me my rookie year. I don't know if you remember this, and it helped me not only today in life, but it helped me get through basketball, through my career, and even, even when I have such situ situations that I'm going through, I think about this. You told me, hey, Jack, whatever you do, don't worry about just keeping it real. Also keep it right. You told me that my rookie year before I even got a chance to set foot in the league, and I remember that to this day, bro. And I thank you for giving me that game because I held on that all, all this time through everything I've been through. I held on that, and I shared that with younger kids coming up, too. I'm glad I gave you something. You only lasted two weeks, but uh, somehow you came back around yeah. and had a hell of a career. That's yeah, funny. man, thanks. Hey, you, meant, you mentioned Hello White earlier, but I think you got your black card the one time you were up on stage and Nicki Minaj gave you that uh, lap dance at her concert. What was, what was that like? Um, that was, that was uh, a unique experience, to say the least. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm also going to say I, it was I would have, too. Sort of, yeah. sort of, sort of unfulfilling now. <laughs> a, little, a, a, a little bit of a tease, huh? <laughs> oh, oh hell yeah! Oh, that's funny. Hey, also, man, shout oh, out man. to Legends. You know, uh, we're, we're partners in a, a, in a yeah. uh, sports apparel company. I see you got the nice army green sweatshirt on right now. Shout out Legends. Yes, sir. Go to Legends.com for all your merchandise. Yeah. Yes. Steve For is sure. one of the main owners. Um, talk to us a little bit. What has life after basketball been like? You shared that, Ooh. you know, you have a house full of kids, but what have you yeah. been into personally, passion? I yeah. know you're a huge soccer lover. I know you're huge on the content space. Talk to us a little bit about what retirement has been like for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, first and foremost, uh, it, retirement's hard. And I don't know how, how you guys dealt with it. You know, it took me two years to really be like, okay, I'm, I'm good now. But I was lucky because the end of my career was a nightmare, trying to stay healthy, trying to play. When I was here with the Lakers, it was like, I trained twice a day for over two years, trying to get myself, give myself a chance to contribute. Um, eventually, you know, I realized it wasn't happening and, and, and my body just had too many miles on it. But, um, 
that process, I think, allowed me like a precursor, like to say, this is going to be difficult. Like I could feel where this is going. It's going to be over. And then what? And, you know, those are some real soul searching when you're thinking like, okay, you've put everything you have into this. This is your identity. This is your outlet. Um, you know, the, the competition, the teammates, all the, the, the schedule, you know, that, that process, you know, even j- j- driving downtown every other night and showing off in front of 20,000 people, like those big, big holes that, you know, basketball will leave behind. And so when I struggled for those last two years, I think it, it allowed me to start to, you know, recognize that this is going to be difficult. And it took me two years to really get through the other side where I felt whole. But a lot of that was due to the fact that I wasn't like, you know, it wasn't a, a terrible two years, but it was like, I could tell, you know, like I'm transitioning still. I'm, I'm still trying to come to grips with this. Like there's something missing, like something's pulling me and I can't fulfill it. And so it took me two years. I got through that. But the one thing that I did do was give myself that time, you know, not try to rush, um, I also, you know, always prioritize being a dad. So spend a lot of time with the kids, still do, try to work all my other projects and things around the kids for the last, wow, so, I mean, it's already been six years, I think, you know, which which has been fulfilling and, and what I love. Um, and then I fit the other things I'm doing. So our content stuff uh, at Control Media, we're, you know, we're working on a few things, a Pistol Pete film. Um, oh, dope. We, you know, doing different things in all formats, digital um, film and television. And, and, you know, it's not a huge company at this stage, but we're doing things that we're passionate about and enjoying it and hopefully making great content. Um, I obviously love... Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously I love soccer. I grew up playing soccer. My dad, my mom and dad are from the UK. My dad was a soccer player. My brother played soccer. So I love the game. So I got involved with Mallorca, a team in Spain, um, as an owner, and I'm on the board there. So I've been trying to help you know, just uh, contribute to building that club back up. When we got there, we were in the second division. We actually went down to the third division, came back to the second. Now we're actually in the top flight in the in La Liga, playing against Barcelona and Real Madrid. So that's been a really rewarding and exciting experience that that, that I that I put time into. Uh, and I consult for the Warriors. So you know, I have a little bit of basketball, a little bit of soccer, a little bit of content, and a lot of a lot of being dad. Is it an actual movie about uh, Pistol? It's going to be a movie about Pistol Pete? Yeah. Like an actual dramatic, movie? A, yeah, an actual dramatic film. So we we um, just signed... Not uh, saying you are. Not, not saying you are, but if anybody can play Pistol Pete, <laughs> I think you could. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we don't want bro- we don't we don't want broke back uh, you know broken down pistol <laughs> you, uh, you know but uh, hopefully you know it's, we'll be able to tell a great story about him you know I think it's largely a father son story you know I mean we can go through his career accolades and arc but you know what what made him the player and also what made him kind of the tortured soul I think was relationship with his father. Um, so following that is, uh, I think, an important thread of the film. But we're, we're, we we signed on a writer director, Brad Furman, who's done the Inf- Infiltrator with Brian Cranston. He's done the Lincoln Lawyer with Matthew McConaughey. Mm-hmm. So he, he played blue. college hoops, loves loves Pistol Pete. So he's in a unique position, I think, to to try to hone in on what the story is. And, uh, and you know, That's I dope. think it, it, as a as a basketball player, you know, someone like Pete, who was kind of this. You know, he was way ahead of his time, but he was also a tortured mm-hmm. individual. You know, we want to leave a legacy for these guys that many of kids, you know, younger than us, you know, they don't know a story. So it'd be great to be able to tell it and familiarize many people or refamiliarize, you know, the majority of people with, with his great story. Mm-hmm. I think you made a great point. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to our next subject, but the history of the game, I think today more than ever, kids don't understand it, don't appreciate it, rarely respect it. Mm-hmm. And I think this quarantine situation has kind of changed that somewhat um, with mm-hmm. people being able to go back and see old footage and see old games on NBA TV and not just in basketball and all different sports. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because like I said, you have kids yeah. that are on the internet all the time now and I do too. And it's, it's always, what have you sure. done for me lately type stuff. What are your thoughts on just kind of the lack of understanding with uh, the history of the game from kids today? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes hand in hand with social media, um, you know, and, and I get it. And I also get that, like, if they go back and watch anything, like, from our primes, you know, it's not even high def. Right, <laughs> you know, like, so, like, barely can you know, see it. Right? Crazy. I mean, they, so, like, they, 
when they first, as soon as they see it, they probably, for these kids that have grown up, that everything they've ever seen is like Inside, crystal yeah. clear. They look at us. And, right. And, and it just looks different. So right away, there's probably a, a barrier for them. But, you know, I think this is great if they can learn, you know, there is no current generation without the one before and, and all the way back to those pioneers who started the game. So, um, you know, it's important to respect everything that everyone's done in the past. You know, I certainly respect this generation of players and think they're amazing and love watching mm-hmm. them play. Um, you know, big fan of the game right now and all the players. So uh, I think, but I think it's a two-way street and, and I, I definitely respected those that came before me. And I guess what you guys are getting at is that you know, maybe we had more reverence for those that came before us when we were coming up. Uh, and those, you know, even when we were just teenagers, we probably heard about the history of the game, gravitated towards it, wanted to know about it, and, and had reverence for those players that came before the ones that we were currently watching. Yeah, well, and let, well let's, let, let, let's stick to, uh, to that subject, uh, The Last Dance. Mm. We, it, came out, it came out yesterday. Everybody watched it. I know everybody was tuned into it, Michael Jordan and uh, the Bulls. Um, you was in the league already at that time. You had to go up mm. against Mike. Give me, uh, t- let's talk about that. Tell, give me an experience or two. Uh, you know, for me, he's the greatest player to ever play the game. And um, he was my hero as a kid. Got a chance to play against him. You know, 96, 97, I came in the league. You know, it, it, that was, you know, the, around the time right that the this mist. was. Right, it was, I think, so the, I think the last dance was 97, 98. So yeah. the, my, my second year in the league. Um, so I got to, I got to, I mean, you guys remember what it was. We didn't have so much access back then to every single thing on Instagram or YouTube, let alone watching games live. So, you know, it was, MJ was must see TV. Like anytime mm-hmm. he was on TV, like it was must see. Um, and WGN. Just, yeah, I mean, he, exactly. He just had this charisma on top of all the gifts and skills and, and mentally, you know, how great he is. I mean, Playing against him, the one thing that I think that he was unlike any other player I've ever played against is that it, there was a real fear playing against mm. him. Like, like people, I've never seen like the league be kind of fearful of a player or have that much reverence for a player. No matter who you who, you know, has come since then, you know, that was a different feeling when you're playing Mike because you just knew, you know, like there was there was such a seriousness, a competitiveness, and fire in him and. You know, there was a fear with how that was going to manifest itself potentially on any given night. So he was, he was, I mean, wh- where do you want to start and where do you want to finish with him? He, he, he was, he was everything. I think we take, because of social media, stuff for granted. You know what I mean? We're, mm-hmm. LeBron is one of, you know, our heroes now and he gives constant mm-hmm. access. And you see guys from other sports give constant access. But like you were saying, that wasn't the, the case back then. You know what I mean? Like, there was no behind the scenes. There was no going in the Bulls' locker room. You didn't see the Bulls shoot around. You didn't see MJ off the court. And he is our one hero that we didn't really get to see that from. You know, we got, Mm -hmm. rest in peace, Kobe started showing that um, Mm -hmm. post-career. LeBron has been amazing from the jump. But for us as as former players, and, and Mike being someone we idolize, obviously Mike and Pip and the Bulls, someone we idolize, it's special for us because... We kind of always wanted to know, like, what was it like behind the scenes? Because we know what it's really like behind the scenes. So, what was it like behind the scenes for them? You know. So, I yeah. think it's it's amazing. That's a great point. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but watching the first two episodes didn't it just take you back, like, to being a kid almost? Yes. Like, like yes. what it felt like Same, to watch yeah. him? Like, like it, uh, like you just. It's amazing how the pull he had over us. And you're right. Like, we didn't get that access. Like, we didn't get. You know, like you said, all that stuff that current players have just grown up providing. You know, they've grown up with right. phones and cameras and social media. That There was none of that, you know. So, you know, mm-hmm. to, to go and watch it is like putting us, our generation, back to our teenage or younger being a years. Kid, being a kid, being a kid, being a kid. And, and, mm-hmm. and getting to see those things that you never got to see. Um, you know, we hear the stories, but to actually see some footage coupled with some stories is incredible. Yeah, I think one good thing, like I said, obviously there's nothing good that came from the loss of Kobe, but I, I think at the uh, his memorial, you know, the way MJ stepped up, you know, I, we mm. hadn't seen yeah. vulnerable Mike before. We hadn't seen Mike open up. The speech he gave was tremendous. Him helping Vanessa down the stairs was timely. And I, I, I want to say, and I kind of feel like, and I hope I'm right, that maybe seeing what Kobe was on and what he was doing and how he was mentoring, helping, opening up more, 
I'm hoping that that kind of struck, struck a match in Mike's in Mike's mind because yeah. I think he has been, you know, with, with, with due process. I mean, the greatest ever. You know what I mean? So I'm sure a lot of shit comes with that. I can't even speak to what comes with that, but I just think him opening up more um, is yeah, as, as a fan. You know, as a grown man, that's what I want to see now. You know what I mean? And I think yeah. with this the, with this last dance, I I hope that we start to get to see more of Mike because he's been the one superstar for a lot of people that we just never really got to know off the court. Yeah, I, I completely agree. You know, it's, um, you know, it was, it, uh, when I got to play with Kobe for, uh, you know, uh, a few, you know, we didn't get to, we both got hurt, but having to share the locker room with him at the end of our career, it, it was an eye opener in a sense, because you forget we got drafted together. We played against each other our whole careers. You know, you th I thought of him as a competitor. Uh, I thought of him as, as the competition, you know, predominantly. So when I came to the Lakers and you could see the, like, the, the worship that young players had for him, you know, it was an eye-opener because I never had that perspective of him. But that's exactly how I was with Jordan, if you know what I mean. Like, when I came mm -hmm. in the league. Right. So right. I'd been there. You know, I'd been there. I'd done what they were doing to Kobe, how exciting it was to play with Kobe. I'd... I'd done having the chance to play against Jordan, you know? Um, and, I, and so to get more from, from Mike, he doesn't owe anybody anything, but to get more of him, for him to, Facts. you know, to make the speech at Kobe's service, for him to do the film, for him to, you know, just be a little bit more open. He's probably, like you said, relaxed. Uh, you know, it's amazing for us. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a different time, right? Like, this might be it. We may not get nothing, anything else out of him, but that's why this is so special. We just got <laughs> right. like, right. to enjoy it. What are your thoughts on the 2020 Hall of Fame class? We were just speaking on Kobe briefly, uh, adding KG and Tim Duncan to that. Some are saying that's arguably the greatest uh, Hall of Fame class ever to be inducted. What are your thoughts on that? Hard to beat that, that trio. Um, you know, that's incredible. Happy for all those guys, obviously. Uh, you know, it's it's important for everyone to see Kobe go in and kind of have that moment um, mm -hmm. to recognize what he brought to the game, what he meant to the game. I mean, you know, he was a great player, obviously, uh, but he touched a nerve with people around the world. Um, and I think we saw that when he passed. Um, you know, it, it was incredible how just his name, his presence meant so much to so many people in so many places that maybe you wouldn't expect it to be so strong. Um, so I think, you know, I mean, look, those guys are all incredible, incredible, all-time greats. Um, but it is also special, I think, to, to that, they, that they can go in with Kobe, Kobe can go in with them um, and, and, and be recognized just for the impact as much as, as the accolades, you know. Uh, it's it's Absolutely. something I think we all need to see. So it's 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 an incredible class, and, and hopefully we get to do it right, especially in this crazy time where it's not going to probably right. be your, your, you know, your normal right. scenario. Uh, hopefully we get some time to, things can get back to normal and we can honor that class the way they deserve to be honored. Very true. Taking it back to your early days, born in South Africa, moved to uh, Canada at a young age, came from a predominantly soccer family, didn't start Ooh. basketball till 12 or 13. What do you remember when you, you know, where did that spark for basketball and yeah. wanted you to pick up your first basketball start? Yeah, I mean, there's two things. Really, one was social. I, I went to, where I grew up in Canada, junior high was grades 8, 9, 10. High school was a grade 11 and 12. So I went to the eighth grade. Um, had played a little bit of basketball and all the kind of jocks at my new school all played basketball. They were all basketball players. That was their number one sport. So I quickly wanted to be with guys that were playing, whatever you're playing. I wanted to be on the playground playing. And so all these guys were playing basketball and uh, we became, you know, best friends, played bat. you know, just got totally obsessed with the game. And it was exactly at the, like, it was right around the time that the Air Jordan 1s came out and, and Mike kind of burst onto the scene and was like, was just like, you know, he was like a, lang a whole language unto himself just watching him, you know, like it, it was just such an elevated performance. Um, and it was right around the time that, the, you know, the Air Jordans came out and he was doing commercials with Spike Lee. So it was super like cool time to get, him, to get into basketball. I mean, now we have so much media around the game. Back then, like a commercial was like, you know, uh, uh, seeing a, uh, an incredible, like, commercial with personalities like Mike and Spike, 
you know, that it was like going to the movie theater almost. Like if you were lucky enough to catch the commercial, <laughs> really? you know, like right. you would take you would take right. games and you would rewind and watch the commercial ten times, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So th- th- that that was definitely something that that got me into the got me excited about the game. But really, it was social. I was still playing soccer and hockey and baseball and all these sports, but. You know, when I saw eighth grade, 13, these guys playing all the time, loving the game. I had friends to play with before school, lunchtime, after school. And um, I just took it from there and never stopped and just got more and more sucked in and obsessed with the game and, uh, and, and loved, played it, you know, played it a long, long time. Senior year, you, you put up some numbers, nearly 21 points, 11 assists, nine rebounds. Who were you stealing rebounds from? Uh, led, led, led your team to the championship and was named Player of the Year. Uh, what was the competitive nature of high school ba- or high school basketball in um, Canada back then? Yeah. Well, it was we? Had, well, the, I think our year, our class was a good year. There were some good teams, good players, like at, you know, guys that could play like a lot of guys that could play some level of college basketball, but it was, you know, it wasn't, you know, where I grew up, it wasn't always like the most, as far as the highest level. Um, Mm -hmm. But there was always good players. There was always a good culture. There was always a lot of interest around high school basketball. Um, You know, it was probably the most popular high school sport by far Um, because, you know, soccer, hockey, all those sports were played at the club level. So, for high school, oh, okay. it was super. It was it was inc- it was fun, exciting. The, the provincial championships up there meant a lot. Um, you know, I was I, I was lucky. I had a I had an incredible coach. You know, he was uh, he played college basketball in Canada. I was uh, you know really as good a mind for the game as anyone I've ever played for. Uh, he was he was extremely prepared and detailed. So I got a glimpse of what I was going to see from college and pro coaches in high school in a sense where like little things, little details at both ends of the floor, whether it's individually with your footwork or whether it's collectively with rotations or timing and all those things. So, you know, I, I got to play for an incredible coach um, and I've, I've been fortunate in that respect. I got to play for a lot of great coaches, but that I think you know, gave me an education that allowed me to continue to adapt while I was still physically kind of growing into, you know, my best level where I could compete. Because I wasn't like a lot, you know, I never was a live wire, but I wasn't like this kid who went right away, oh yeah, I could see him playing in the league. You know, I think people were like, probably too slow, too short, too weak. So I had to get myself up to like an acceptable level in all those categories. But in the meantime, you know, I had a good skill level and I had a good understanding and education of how to to play the game and so that allowed me I think I needed it all like I, I didn't you know I didn't have the you know the the fortune to say well I'll just out, out you know out athlete people jump over people be faster than people <laughs> you know I had to I had to like shoot it well enough play make be smart be a great teammate know the game and 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 somehow I just kept like finding a way to get to the next level and uh, that that all started in, in high school with my high school coach. You forgot craftiness. Crafty. <laughs> Blanco. <laughs> Go ahead, Jack. Hey, you kind of talked about it earlier, but uh, being recruited by one school, you know, yeah. going to going to Sarah, Santa Clara. Tell me some memories about Santa Clara and being yeah. recruited by one school. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was like, it was exciting just, just to have a scholarship offer, you know. Um, that was like my ticket, you know, I wanted to play in the NBA. Uh, and I know at the time it probably seemed improbable, but I could kind of see a clear path. I could see that, you know, my skill level could get there, and if I could athletically catch up a little bit, um, you know, with my work ethic, I knew that I would put the time in. And if I was improving at this rate, you know, in in two years, four years, six years, there's no reason why I couldn't kind of rate, you know, rein some of these other players in. And and that's kind of the way I went around about it. And um, Santa Clara was, you know, an incredible squad, a great coach again, t- really tough, uh, which, you know, like he, he was hard on me, especially when I first got there. And I'll say it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I mean, you know, he had me, he had me thinking about quitting, you know, and mm. that going through that experience, like made everything after that, you know, it was easy to overcome adversity. And, and so I, I thank him. He gave me mental toughness, as you guys know, like, Great players in the NBA all have mental toughness, the ability to overcome and to face obstacles and challenges. And, and that's that's more than anything, that's what I got at Santa Clara. Now, the experience was great, too. Great teammates, still friends with a lot of, with all my teammates. 
Um, it's a, it was a special experience in that respect. Uh, but for, as a basketball player, I learned a lot from the coach, and, and prim primarily I learned mental toughness and ability to just not give in, not fall, not you know take your foot off the gas no matter how dark it got some days. You led them to the tournament, um, the NCAA tournament, but during the height of your college career, who were some of the guys possibly in the pros or other college guys that you emulated or studied or, or tried to, you know, take a little bit of their game and add it to yours. Yeah. So I grew I mean, my hero growing up was Isaiah Thomas from as far as who I wanted to emulate. Um, you know, he had, I, he had everything, but he wasn't jumping over people. So I was like, okay, there's somebody that I can try to emulate. Like he was quick. Um, but like other than that, he used his skill level, his creativity, his competitive nature, like the fight in him was incredible. Um, he was a dog. Clutch. He was a dog. And so those are things that I was like, okay, I can try to emulate that. You know, my, MJ was my hero. There was, there was nothing other than maybe his footwork I was going to emulate from, you know, MJ. So so Isaiah was the guy that I really tried to emulate. Um, you know, my, my freshman year of college, Jay Kidd was a freshman too. So those... those he, you know, he came out after his sophomore year. We played against each other in college, uh, both in the Bay Area. So I, I always, you know, strive to to learn from him and also try to, you know, put myself at it, get to that level one day. Um, so that, you know, but I, I was the type of guy that I, I would try to take something from everybody. You know, I would try to watch, you know, somebody do something and and see how that could translate to my game and how could I incorporate that and and it might come from the strangest places but I, I was always watching always always learning from guys watching them play always trying to incorporate what they did on the floor and and make myself grow and put more tools in, in my toolbox so that I could solve more problems so I could be a bigger contributor to my team and just continue to push the button there go but, uh, between your um your junior senior year you played on the Canadian national team you had a chance to mm -hmm. work out with Gary Payton and Jason mm -hmm. Kidd what, what was that like and what did they teach you yeah uh you know I I, I worked out with in, with Gary and Brian Shaw in Gary's backyard with Gerg yeah, with Gerg wow. yeah, shout yeah. out Gerg That's what's up crazy. Gerg yeah, but he said was, in the backyard, so that's back in the Gary, day. That's like you know, that's yeah. really outside on the on the yeah. cement court, the the hoop. Yeah. I love it. I mean, Gerg putting us through drills out there. Um, I mean, Gary must have already been an all star. Brian, you know, played a long time in the league. We're playing one on one, doing drills with Gerg. It was like, it was incredible. You know, those guys, Jason too. Like they, we worked out at other times together, and you know, they they. They were supportive, you know, which is important. But you could also see the competitive nature, the fire, the, like, once you step on the court, everything meant something, you know. Like, there was no, like, I'll give him this one, you know. It was like, mm -hmm. it was like fuck that. Not with them. And so, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not with so, them. <laughs> so um, I love that. I loved, like, trying to, trying to creep up to compete with them. Um and to get that access. You know, nowadays I think, I feel like there's so much access, whether it's, you know, a high school player getting to meet pros, getting to know everything they've ever done um, in the gym. Like, what, you know, the, back then there wasn't that same access because of social media, YouTube, mm -hmm. Instagram. No. You, don't, you didn't really know what guys did, right? Or what they were like. So, right. um, and it's no. changed in a sense. Like mm -hmm. now, nowadays, everyone really drills, 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 skill development. You know, back then there was a lot more like one-on-one, -on -one, like pickup basketball, like competing, like learning through, Playing. I'm going to play one-on-one. -on yeah, we're going to play one-on-one. -on -one, and if you beat me, I have to figure out a way to beat you. Like, what is it? Is it the angles I take, the footwork? How do I create space? Like, you learned it by trial and error and by necessity, in a sense. Whereas nowadays, it's like the books have all been written, in a sense. Like, you know, there's so many people out there just teaching the game. Um, but there's, which is great. But there's something lost in that, like, really, like, competing. And I think that, you know, you can do all the drills in the world. Um, you can learn all the footwork and everything, which is important. But... Um, there's something built on battling, you know, and playing mm -hmm. and losing and winning and picking yourself up. And like, you know, nowadays it's just, it's a different generation. I don't want to make this a slight because it, it's nobody's fault. Um, but sometimes, you, you, you know, there isn't enough of that. Like where guys are like, I, you know, in the gym, I'm going to put myself on the line against this guy. Now it's like, well, there's phones everywhere. Like, I'm not sure I want to like play one-on-one -on -one with so-and-so and have it yeah. be on the gram, the gram in five minutes um 
Right. So it's a different. Right. It's a different. It's. I mean, that's just one small anecdote. It's a different time, but I learned a lot from from Gary, Jason, and uh, it just felt good to kind of, in a sense, find feel a little acceptance because I was a, a one scholarship kid at a mid major trying to make a name for himself, and uh, it, it was a great experience. And I, I think you hit on it too. I think obviously now the because this is no slight to knock everyone is to, but that the talent and skill level athleticism is incredible mm. right now. But uh, I kind of think incredible. they some of them lack the the, the IQ and, and some heart when it mm. comes to actually like you said going one on one outside. It was a war. There was no right. buddy buddy. There was no right. cell phones. There was no pictures. They would, we would right. fight. Like there used to be some yeah. real shit that would help you get and stuff that we sure. would take from our teenage years to the sure. NBA. And, and I think you agree. Like I said, it's no knock. It's just a different generation. But obviously, times yeah. were different with that. When did you feel like, okay, I'm going to be a pro? What, what year in college, and high school? Like, when did it really click to, to, in your yeah. mind? Like, okay, I could do this shit for a real living. That's a good question. I think, you know... Being an, like an underdog, I always had that underdog mentality, so I never really like counted my chickens, you know? So like, I had a great junior year, there was some talk about should I leave, you know? It, wasn't, it was much less common in those days, especially for, you know, a Canadian kid at a mid-major, like, well, we have, you know, like, it, we need to see more of him kind of thing. So I stayed, but I think like, I started to realize, I think I played in the world championships after my sophomore year and had a, and started for Canada. I must have been 19, 20 years old and had a good tournament. There was a lot of NBA scouts there. And it, that kind of started the buzz to where I was like, okay, this really could happen. And then had a good junior year, thought about coming out, didn't. And then had a maybe not quite as good a senior year, just, you know, dynamics of the team or facing a lot of attention from the other teams but still had a great year one in the first round it's somewhere between like the summer after my sophomore year um and and being drafted you know there it was building you know it was building it but again when i got to the league and when i was a first round pick you have a three-year guarantee like there's some security there i still came in the league as an underdog like i have to prove myself every day like there's mm -hmm. no like there's no i've made it you know there's no like um, you know, I belong. I mean, there was no entitlement. It was like I, I felt like I had the appropriate fear that I have to prove this every day or I could every be out. Day. You know, I could be out. So it's just it, it's just different, you know, different time. You know, and you know, like back then you're a rookie. You got treated like a rookie. You know, you got treated by a rookie, oh, by man. a teammate. They, 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 they just made a big trade, though, with McDice, McLeod, all of them that just came back, right, when you got there, yeah. Steve? Uh, at some point... I can't remember if they were there. Uh, yeah, I think that was right. You're right. My rookie year, right? Because, because that so. was the reason why they had one draft pick with me the next year because they had made those trades to get those right, guys. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was... And... It was... Yeah, go on. No, and to keep it real, I'd like to touch on what you're saying, a, a spade is a spade. You're a small little white dude playing against GP, J Kid, mm. all these guards. Like we're not gonna, you know, we're gonna bust this white dude's ass, and that's how. Mm. I mean, that talk is still prevalent till today. So I can only imagine back then, like, you know, you're coming from a mid-major, trying to make your name, but you're nice. But like, you know, I could only picture GP saying, "I'm not gonna let this white dude bust my ass." You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> so every every single night, you were going to war with solidified yeah. Hall of Fame point guards. You know, back then it wasn't so much about social media and all that, but you didn't want your friends back home to know that this little white boy just, right. you know, turned you Busted over. Your so, ass. Right? right? So there, there was yeah. a little extra sometimes, but um, you know that makes you that, <laughs> <laughs> but that makes you tougher, right? It makes you more competitive. Absolutely, and, that's what I'm saying. It's part of that grind. It makes you, you know, just thicker skin and and to be able to survive because it is. It's a, in the NBA like there's, you know. A big part of it is just survival, right? Like, cause you, if you yeah. if you're not if you're not ready to play, you can get embarrassed. If you get embarrassed too many times, you're gone, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, it, it, you know, it, maybe it is a little different now. The play, the players now, you're right. They're so athletic, so they're, but they're a little more specialists. You know, they um, in a sense, uh, it's just a different. They grow up differently, and and they're amazing. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a different time, and you. You definitely just had to. You had to really uh, earn your stripes with your teammates. You know, the referees around the league. Uh, you do today. You do today. This is not like I love this generation. So this is this is just giving you a picture of both. Um, but mm -hmm. back then it was like, I mean, I remember after every practice, 
like AC Green was one of my vets, and he'd just like kick every ball all over the gym, the stadium, wherever we were, <laughs> and be like, "Go, go get him, Rook," and was, you know all that type of stuff. So uh, it's just a different era, and uh, and uh, I loved it. Though it was it was great to look back on all those memories, especially now that that's a bygone era. It's crazy, man. Right? Like yeah. I don't feel old, but like it's it's a bygone era. No, we had uh, we had Jay, uh, ja, ja Morant on. Last mm. week, and he was talking to us about music, and he called Jay Z old school. And me and Jack kind of looked at herself like, "Fuck." <laughs> he, he, I mean, he is. You know what I mean? Yeah, he is. These, these kids he are is. these kids are twenty, twenty one years old. Yeah. Like, it, he he's old school, and it's just like, yeah. damn, that went by fast. You know, it went by we fast. We speak man. to like, we used to come in, and there used to be a pecking order, no matter how good you were, because there was vets. You know right. what I mean? So mm. to be talented, lottery pick, whatever, to crack that lineup, it was yeah. different. You know, right. no matter how good you were, someone on your team or a vet was going to have a problem with you trying to crack that lineup. But right. it also, like you said, it made us tougher, it made us stronger. And then you had those vets that would put your arm around you and, 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 oh. and, and, and school you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Keep you from making the same mistakes. And I really don't see that anymore from a standpoint of just the league is so young. Mm -hmm. So your, yeah, vet, yeah. Your, your vet is yeah. a couple years older than you now, which is yeah. crazy. Yeah, I mean, the way the salary cap is too, you know, like a vet minimum for a guy who's played 12 years over a talented, um, you know, explosive kid that you want to take a chance on. Like financially, like, you know, it's it's much more manageable with the cap and all that stuff. So the model doesn't really support, you know, vets in that respect anymore. Right. Um, you know, there's 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 very few like Jared Dudleys around anymore. Whereas like mm -hmm. there was there was a there was two or three on every team when I came in. Every the team, you know, right? Um, you know, the vets, good the model room, kind of good vets. yeah. The mo and the, it was the model of the salary cap and all that stuff supported that. And now it doesn't. It's not not for better or for worse. You know, I think it's a shame that we don't have room for both. But um, you know, that was definitely a benefit in that respect of having vets that could show you the ropes that could you know, teach you, share with you, keep you in line. That was, you know, that, that's got to be a little bit more difficult for young players today because every team's got like four mm -hmm. or five 19, 20, 21 year olds. The 96 draft, legendary. Mm -hmm. Allen Iverson went one, Camby went two, Sharif Abdul Rahim three, Marbury four, Ray Allen five, Antoine Walker six, Kerry Kittles eight, Kobe 13, Paige Stoyakovich 14, you land 15. What do you remember about that draft and God, I mean, how talented that class was? I mean, it was one of the best times of my life, you know, actually getting drafted and kind of like, like I talked about the Hall of Fame, putting a bow on it. Uh, it's like the draft kind of justified all the hours, you know, like getting drafted in the first round, like really, you know, was the reward, was that moment of like, okay, all that time, all that energy and hustle and all the tough days, the days you didn't want to do it, you know, this is the reward. And so it was a special, special time. And then, you know, at the time I knew it was a talented draft for sure, but you don't know in context, like where everyone's going to go on, what kind of careers right. they're going to have. What's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You have no idea. So like, there was no way you could have predicted it, but um, but you, but I knew there was a lot of personalities. There was a lot of talent, and uh, and looking back, it's it's incredible to see the careers that so many of my classmates had. First time around in Phoenix, who who mm. were some of your vets? Yeah, my vets were like Rex Chapman, Danny Manning. Oh, gee, Rex. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, sat next to Rex on the plane. Hilarious. Uh, taught me a lot, uh, still mm. friends to this day. Danny Manning was a great vet, unbelievable player. Like, I mean, he'd already done his ACL. Back then, it wasn't as, it wasn't like ACLs now where you come back. Because Danny was like a 6'10 point forward who was really quick. He lost he a little so bit of that. He has so much game. He has People so much game. People don't understand that, man. No, and, and when he tore his ACL, like today, you come back fully, maybe even better sometimes. Stronger, and it wasn't, right. It wasn't like that. And so... You know, he, he lost a little bit of quickness and, a, and I think a lot of, like, mobility, durability in that knee, but he could play so smart, 6'10", could post, could point, play the point, could pass, read, react, cut. You know, so I learned a lot from those vets. Kevin Johnson, uh, Hot Rod. Mm. You know, Hot Rod Williams, rest in peace. Wayman Tisdale, rest in peace. You know, guys that mm -hmm. were just, you know, good pros, uh, supportive, taught me a lot. And so, you know, it was... Uh, I was fortunate, you know. I, I came in behind Kevin. We traded for Jason Kidd, so I had Jason and Kevin. So I, I also got to play behind two great, great point guards. Um, and, that, and I learned a, a tremendous amount from those guys. Donnie Nelson was in the office in Phoenix. He moves to Dallas, and they trade for you the 97-98 season. 
What was that like going over there and, and, and with, with the young Dirk and uh, Mark Cuban as an owner? Mm. Yeah, I mean, at first I, did, I, wa- I didn't want to, you know, go. I love Phoenix. You know, uh, Jack will tell you, it's great down there. Man. You know, it, oh, Phoenix it was, is beautiful. Yeah, it was beautiful. a great city. The organization, Jerry was unbelievable. Um, you know, it just felt great it felt like home and my second year with jason and kevin i still got like 20 plus minutes a game danny ainge was crazy enough to play all three of us together and and that was a uh, that was a great moment in my career playing with jason and kevin and still being able to push myself into 22 minutes a game or whatever my second year was a great accomplishment for me and was proving that i was continuing on the right path so then for it to be kind of over in a respect um after that season was disappointing but uh, Dallas is one of the worst teams in the league. I got traded there on draft day when Dirk got drafted by the Mavs, and we played in the old Reunion Arena. And you know, it just it wasn't in the same place that that Phoenix was at the time. So it was a, it was in a uh-huh. sense it was like a step down. And then we had the lockout that year. I, I I remember I was playing a pickup game like a week before training camp, and I got knocked out of the air going to the basket and landed on my back, and mm. I struggled the whole year. And I, that's when I realized I had back problems that season, you know, that I that I congenital and had a long time. But that's when I really that they presented themselves and became a problem. So I struggled the first lockout year, struggled a little bit the second year, and then you know Dirk and I, I think turned a corner. Mark Cuban bought the team, and the Mavericks became one of the places to be, so to speak. So. Uh, got ourselves to the conference finals. Jack, you were on that team, were you? Uh, San Antonio? Yep. Dallas, mm-hmm. yep. conference finals, oh, lost. Yeah. Um, remember Stevie Kerr came in and hit like four or five threes in the fourth quarter yep. of the clincher. Yep. Um, anyways, so playing for Mark was incredible. He, he um, you know, it wasn't all, you know, like Mark could, you know, in some ways get under your skin at times, but... He was such a pioneering person for the game, like pushing the envelope on everything, the rules, you know, the way we went about things, refereeing, marketing, like so many ways he tried to upgrade <laughs> everything, everything that, the, that we did in the league. And so it was incredible to watch him. He's a kind of a force of nature in that respect. And so to be there from the start with him was, was, was exciting. And that was a, a very influential time in my career. I so, led the team in scoring that game, by the way. Oh, What'd you drop? Like How many? Tw- I had a 24. Okay. The, in yeah, in the clinching game. game? Game game six, yeah. Tough. Uh, I think people Steve, forget though. Little... I was just saying, I think people forget. Jack, you were like the sec- you were like the second best player on the team. People forget oh, the, in like hey. in the see, history. See, I don't of... talk I, I don't talk much, but see, when we have guests like double MVPs like you and Hall of Famers like you, that's all I need. I don't talk much because people, I got over, I got overshadowed by the 4-3 Steve hit, but if they look at quarters 1, 2, and 3, y'all had Tim on lock. Tim couldn't get a bucket, and I had to save us. Me and Gino, actually. Me and Gino really saved us. Mm, yeah, I mean, you guys obviously had a great team and all that stuff, but I think sometimes your little run there uh, might be a little underappreciated. Thanks, my guy. We recognize it. Take us back a little bit to to the the development, uh, developing a friendship with Dirk Mm. and his growth and when you guys kind of felt like you guys were clicking and your chemistry started hitting and you like, holy shit, this motherfucker is going to be a problem. Yeah. I mean... You could see right away. We, I mean, first of all, <laughs> he said you could see right away. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, you could see the kid was talented. I mean, just the way the ball left his hand and the way it fell through the hoop, right? Like, yeah. he's a seven foot guy. He shoots the ball way up in the air and it to comes down. It comes mm-hmm. down in the. It comes down like not a swish, like a swish on the bottom of the net. You know what I mean? Like it. Yeah. It yeah. Like, touches the net. You know, you're like this. This. There's some. I don't know, there's something going on here with this kid. And he was, people, I think, especially like nowadays in social media, you you think, you see Dirk as like this guy with his ankles basically locked, can't move, but he was super mobile. You know, like oh, back Dirk in the was day, a killer. he wasn't explosive, but he was mobile. You know, seven feet, he could really move, put the ball down on the floor, spin, run the court, you know, catch and, and make plays off the dribble. You know, so you could see he had all these things, athleticism in that way. Um, when we came in, though, 
I mean, we were one of the worst teams in the league. He was, Dirk was really going through a lot of culture shock. Like he was playing second division in Germany or maybe maybe they just got to the first division, you know, which back then especially was a far cry from the league. He's 19 years old. You know, he was a mama's boy and here we are in mm-hmm. Dallas. Um, I'm struggling, he's struggling. And so the good news was that we came in at the same day together. He wasn't even going to come and play that lockout year. We convinced him to come back and play. So we kind of, in a sense, had each other to lean on, to, to push each other, to play one-on-one, horse, to go back to the gym at night, to keep fighting, keep pushing each other while we struggled, while people were down on us. You know, there was a time people probably thought both of us were going to be out of the league in those first two years. Um, but we kept working. I went through some injury stuff, and he went through kind of that ad- adaptation to living abroad and playing in the league. But I think having each other was huge because we pushed each other. We, you know, continued to encourage each other, could see there was a path for us if we continued to work at it. And so, you know, we stuck with it. And we went from one of the worst teams in the league and barely contributing to, to the conference finals and, and, and playing in all-star games. And that was a, a very influential time in my career. 2002, right. you guys beat Minnesota in three games and then end up falling to Sacramento I mean, KG is one of my favorite players and favorite players to play against. The passion, energy, you know, t- nonstop talking, uh, couldn't shut up. Uh, but I love that. I love, I love the personality and 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 more than anything, I really respect because I know what he put in. I know how much time and effort and how professional he was. He worked really hard. He was incredibly professional, great teammate. Um, so he, he did it the right way and. So it was a, always a, a pleasure to play against him and, and during my career. And then to play against that Sacramento team, those Rick Adelman teams, um, mm. you know, I mean, they, you know, good guards, uh, great guards, obviously, Mike Bibby, Doug Christie, um, but they're bigs. The way, I mean, Peja obviously was maybe their best player at diff- different times during that run, but, you know, the passing of, of Vlade and C. Webb was unbelievable for two big guys. Level. You know, and, and it allowed them to play the game in a way that was so rare and so difficult to defend. Because that ball just moved and and guys would, you know, they'd space the floor and make you pay with back cuts or threes. And, and uh, it was beautiful. I and mean, You know, that year we lost to them in the playoffs. I really felt like Doug Christie and Adelman had a big impact. You know, whenever we were doing our two-man game on one elbow or on one wing, you know, they'd bring Christie over to the middle of the paint. Um mm-hmm. You know, he would kind of, he would actually come all the way to the strong side block. It wasn't no three you know. seconds then, right? It wasn't no three it seconds was. then. He, he, you had to, well, you, yeah, you, but you also, you had to either come or stay. And so he would come all the way instead of the block. Come all the way over. And, yeah, ta- and yeah. take, and so you'd have to throw it to the corner and they would either rotate, stunt, and get back. And, but <laughs> inevitably the ball was gone. I was out of my hands. You know, so it's either play two on three versus Doug Christie as the third man, or throw it to the weak side, and and mm-hmm. I remember that really hurt us in that series. Um, but that's those teams were fun to watch, fun to play against. Sacramento was an incredible place to play. Uh, building felt like it was falling down, but the energy in there was incredible. 2003, 60 win season, uh, beat Portland in seven, beat Sacramento in seven, and then this is where my bad, I misspoke earlier. You ran into the Spurs in the Western Conference Finals where my co-host had a big game six. Uh, talk to us about, because that was, that was your last run in Dallas. Yeah. Talk to us about that. Yeah, it's actually, that was, the, I didn't my know sec- that. that was my second last year in Dallas. Um, so yeah, okay. second last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My yeah. Bad. We got to the conference finals. I think they beat us 4-2. And actually, uh, we won a game without Dirk. Dirk, like, twisted his knee or he something. Hurt. He was hurt. Exactly. And, he missed two games. One of them we won, I think, to bank it 3-2. In San Antonio. And, in San yeah. Antonio. Yeah, we beat them at their place without Dirk to go to bring it back to 2-3. Then we went to Dallas, and that was the Steve Kerr game where he hit those four threes in the fourth quarter. But Jack mm-hmm. had a big game. Yep. Um, you know, that was, that, was, that was a tough team, and, and I don't know that we were ready, but it, it, it made us try to, our, our franchise, try to take steps to, to get over the hump. And so we signed Antoine Walker and Antoine Jameson the next that summer, oh. um, and and it kind of it, it was a it was, you know they were they, it was ballsy they tried something but really you got you got Antoine both Antoines and Dirk playing the same position, right? You know, they're all kind of like mobile fours, uh-huh. and so it uh, it, it just didn't work. Um, it was difficult, um, and that was I think that 
I, I had, I, the, you know, I, I was always a pass first guy. And so I tried to make this thing work. So at first part of the season, half of the season, my numbers were really down. But the second half of the season, I think I shot over 50% and played well. Um, but I think it was like a sign to Mark Cuban that like maybe he thought like this is I was coming to the end because I didn't quite have the the full year that I'd had prior. So that that summer, you know, he he did, he really didn't make a big effort to keep me. Uh, I think he thought he didn't want to overpay. I think he'd overpaid a few guys, didn't want to overpay an aging point guard. Um, and that's you know that's how I ended up in Phoenix. Really it was uh, it was that he wasn't you know he, I don't think he was confident in my future at that point. Um, talk to us a little bit about that second time around because you yeah. guys had a fucking squad. Amari, Sean Marion, Joe Johnson, Q Rich. That small ball uh, was so fun to watch and play against. The incident in 2007, yeah. too. Talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> we, uh, look, it was a fun, obviously a, a fun team. A uh, team, I think, that kind of took the league by storm. You know, we were... Absolutely. You know, I think the year before, we we're, were one of the you know, maybe 126 games. So coming into that year, training camp, people thought, like, this isn't a playoff team. This is a team that, you know, might win 30-something games. Um, so we came out of the gates, I think, like, 31-5. and five. Um, You know, basically, you know, just running people out of the building. And we're playing a style and a pace that was, you know, was rare. And uh, I think it was exciting for the fans. It was fun to play that style, but also we were punishing people. And so, mm-hmm. um, but it was a young team, you know, a lot of guys who'd never played in the playoffs uh, got to the, you know, got to the conference finals. It got to actually play Dallas, my former team, uh, which was, which was difficult, but beat them in the, in the semifinals, then played the Spurs again in the, in the finals, lost 4-1. That was a series that Joe Johnson missed. Um, he played, I think, the last game, the clincher that we lost. Um, so that was tough. It was, you know, they were they were a terrific team. They they had a lot of experience as well, championship pedigree and all that. But, um, you know, it was tough. We were already a team that didn't play a deep bench at all. And so to lose a player as talented as... You know, as Joe was, and, and especially as he yeah. was coming on. You know, he was getting better as the season went on and was a pivotal kind of big guard who could make plays, be the backup. Great handlers. Guard. Great yeah, people handles. People don't realize how good he was. Joe Johnson was so, because he was just so mild-mannered and quiet, but mm. so talented. Just so much game. You know, so much game. Uh, and he was like 6'8", 240 pounds. Um, and, uh, and athletic when he wanted to be. So, um, you know, to lose him was tough. To lose him to Atlanta that summer was even tougher. Uh, mm-hmm. But th- those years in Phoenix were incredible. Um, gave me, you know, some of the best memories of my career. We, we played an incredible playoff series. We never got over the hump, but I think we played in three or four Western Conference finals in, in, a, in an incredibly difficult Western Conference at the time. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't make the finals, but... You know, those were years where the team that came out of the East, we were beating by 30 twice. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> you know so we didn't get to the finals, but we, we also were a finals caliber team that just played in the Western Conference where you had to get through, you know, big teams. Touch, you touched on it tough because the West was definitely dominant back then, but for you to win back-to-back MVPs um, during that, that, that run in Phoenix was historical was amazing but it caught a lot of people by surprise talk to us about that yeah i mean i think it was you know i i went from uh an all-star player to to an mvp and and you know i'll never put myself in the category of tim duncan or or kobe bryant but i think those teams were special our team we led the the league in scoring i think every year i was there and so the i think there was a you know, and I think also we, we forget in time, I don't know that I have to defend myself, but it's like, if forget in time that, you know, although like I average, you know, somewhere between 15 and 18 points in those years, you know, I, you know, I would close games and, and score in the fourth quarter a lot more and, and when, when it was needed. But I still came from the school of being a pass first point guard. So I was never like, I got to go out and get 25. No, I was always like, I want our team to flourish. I want guys to feel good and get easy buckets and I'll step up when I have to. And so th- th- those were special years where I think I took a jump as a player and became more of a threat in every way. But I also got to play with a team that fit really well, maybe needed someone to create for them and then they could finish 
uh, and they could finish with the best of them. So it was a perfect fit in a lot of ways. It, it, it highlighted my game, highlighted their game, and I think collectively we were very difficult to control. Talk to me a little bit about playing with uh, Amari Stoudemire, who was a killer, and then Sean Marion, too. I mean, those are two guys that you could put the ball anywhere. They'd go get rebound, yeah. play defense, played hard. What was it like playing with both those guys? Oh, it was, it was awesome. I mean, you know, especially for someone who loves to – to find his teammates, you know, they're both are incredible athletes. Amari, first of all, incredible feet for a big guy, like really could could move, change directions, and he had big hands and great hands. And so, you know, once once he got a piece of that ball, he could suck it in and, you know, and was, uh, could finish with the, with the best of them, one foot, mm-hmm. two foot. Um, he was incredible as a pick and roll partner of, of transition. Sean was, you know, Sean was, an incredible athlete, like his quickness, speed from end to end, his quickness, ability to guard multiple positions. Um, you know, he, he his second jump was almost as good as his first. So he he could do so many things athletically that were so uh, incredible. Um, so it, it, it was fun. I have these two two guys I could throw lobs to or find on the break for finishes and use their athleticism and speed to, to cause the defense problems. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was very fortunate to get to play with those two guys. Um, 06, Amari goes down uh, with a knee injury. Uh, Raja Bell, Dial, Barbosa, you win your second MVP. You're on the clever Slam magazine, and the, and the headline is, is Nash better than Stockton, kid? What were your thoughts like that? Because things were coming at you so fast. Like I said, you were a proven all-star. You're jumping into this MVP caliber, which, you know, only Hall of Famers basically, you know, get a chance to do. What was all that success like and how did you take it and how did you handle it? I always felt like an underdog. So I always like lost myself in, in like, well, you got to work. Like if you have a big game or you had a big season, your MVP, I never was like, I, I made it. I was always like, I need to do more. I need to do it again. I need to continue to improving. So I never really like took in like the accolades like that. I always like, move right back to my work, you know, right back to my process and just try to stay focused on what that is. Um, one, it helps you handle the pressure and expectations, but two, like it keeps you keeps you sharp, keeps you growing, keeps you getting better. Uh, it simplifies everything. If you just know this is my process, I stick to the way I prepare and perform and recover, you know, then then you're thinking about what matters and not getting the, letting the rest of the stuff get in your head. So, yeah, I just, I, I'd always just reverted back to my work. Yeah, I had a great, a great chemistry. Talk oh, about uh, how, how tough was it losing Amari? Yeah, I mean, that second year, Amari didn't play. We still made the conference finals. But, you know, Boris Diaw was phenomenal playing the five, the four, um, as a playmaker. Dropping triple doubles the, left and right, yeah. yeah hey, and hey, just, hey, Steve, hey, Steve, I don't mean to cut you off, Steve, but I told somebody yeah. this. And they asked me, who was the most talented player I've ever played with in my NBA career? And I told him, Boris Diaw. Mm, I don't know yeah. why people don't believe me. Yeah, he, he I mean, an incredible basketball player. Um, incredible feel for the game, passer. Uh, could, could use that body to, you mm-hmm. know, to punish smaller guards when he got the switches and was, was quick enough and clever enough with the ball, even though he only goes right. To to roast, <laughs> right. to, to, to roast big guys from the perimeter, um, and just like he was, you know, he had the vision, like high high level vision to pass IQ. and make plays. Yes. You know, so when I had the pick and roll with Amari, you know, I'd find Amari for finishes. When I had pick and roll with with Boris, you know, if I draw two defenders and threw it to him, now he's playing two on two, three on mm-hmm. two, and he's the point guard getting in the teeth of the defense, and he was he was incredible in that position. So uh, that that was great. I mean, playing with all those guys, though, Sean, Amari, Boris, it felt great chemistry. Um, and then on top of the chemistry on the court, we always had fun. Like we had great teams. We had great teams that would go out together, go eat together, go to the movies together, spend time mm-hmm. together. So there it's was always important. a little, yeah, there was always a little more on it. There was always a little more feeling in, in the dressing room. And, and I think that was something that made our team special as well. 2007, Amari's back. You guys win 61 games. He plays uh, the whole season. Uh, second round against the Spurs, just getting heated. 2-2, two, two, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And uh, Ori takes one of the most blatant cheap shots. And this is coming from, <laughs> I didn't really take cheap shots. I just made hard fouls. But he takes a blatant cheap shot that kind of changed the whole outlook and, and, and uh, 
of the series, and it was through suspensions and guys stepping on the court. Talk to us about that time because, I mean, obviously the Spurs went on to win. Uh, they beat Utah and then swept Cleveland. You know what I mean? I, I mm-hmm. thought you guys had a great chance to win a championship that year mm-hmm. with a hell of a team, the style of play. Mari was healthy. Talk to us about that second-round matchup. Yeah, man, I mean, it's painful to think about, um, <laughs> you know, like it, it is. I mean, I, I, I love life, and I'm like, life moves on, and I have a great life. But, like, you know, we had a great opportunity there. I think we, with that game, uh, we tied the series 2-2 at their place, going mm-hmm. home, uh, going home to, to regain home court. And uh, it was right at the end of the game, you know, um, and then, and then Amari and Boris get suspended, and obviously we play incredibly small, leading all of Game 5 into the last minute, and they overtake us. Uh, you know, what could have been? But for whatever, you know, reason that things happen, uh, I always look at it like I could have made another play or two to get over the hump and didn't. Um, but definitely there was some, some, some luck involved, as there always is, and, and we didn't get the breaks, but... That's a it's a you know a team that always found a way to put themselves in a position to win and so maximum respect and and they uh, they got us again uh, uh, mm. unfortunately. Just a little context to, for those who don't know. So it's what game four. You guys end up winning that game, right? So we win game four in San Antonio. I actually watched right. it recently. Um, I okay. never watched I never watched anything, but. Uh, um, Bill Simmons does that book about basketball podcast, and he asked me to watch that game and talk about it. So I watched it on my phone, like right away, like anxiety levels through the roof, just going back <laughs> like 13 years. Right. And, and it was alarming Crazy. to watch. You know, it was alarming to watch because we're supposed to be this fast-paced team that, um, you know, pushed the tempo. And the reality is we played right into the Spurs' hands. That game four in San Antonio, I think we, we either took or made five threes you know, we, we won in San Antonio 101, like, 97, or 103, 99, you know. I mean, we should have played so much faster, um, you know, the way they played, how big and how dominant Timmy was. They always had another center alongside him. And, um, you know, so to be in that position was incredible, considering I don't think we played a style. It's contrary to kind of, like, how we remember it that really, you know, represented our best opportunity to win. But... Uh, you know, hats off to the Spurs, always. Yeah. But it just shows, like I said, you won their way, and, that, and that's a sign of a team that can win a championship, you know, especially yeah. considering that was the Spurs, you know. So you get yeah. fouled, Amari and Boris step on the court, that NBA yeah. rule step on the court, which eliminates them from game five, and, yeah. you know, the, the, the rest is NBA history. So that's... It's, it's brutal. I mean, they, you know, they were reacting in shock, you know. They didn't like right. chase anyone down. They jumped, and then there's five or six assistant coaches all on the on the sideline. You have to go on the court to see around them. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like you, it was right down the sideline, so they couldn't like look. They took a step out to see if I was okay, and you know, it wasn't definitely wasn't the spirit of the law. It was like a technicality in a sense. So yeah, it, was, it was unfortunate bullshit. we didn't get to play the series out. Absolutely. Um, any truth? to the rumor that you had spoken to KG that summer about coming to Phoenix? Yeah, there was there was a time ownership asked me to call him uh, and recruit him. Would have been an incredible player to play with, but we didn't have the full cap slot that other teams did. So in a sense, I, I and Kevin tells this story too, that I told him I'm kind of embarrassed to call you because you'd have to take a pay cut to come here, but we'd love to have you. So we did have that conversation. He respected my honesty. Uh, the reality is we just, you know, he would have had to take a, you know, a much lower salary. So it was never really close to happening, I don't think. We tried to get him, too, around that time. That was 07. We was trying to get him mm-hmm. around that time, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The he was, yeah, he said it was Phoenix. He said, who was it? Phoenix, us. He wanted to play with Kobe, too. And it mm-hmm. ended up being Boston. Yeah, I mean, that was a perfect situation, the way they kind of engineered that whole team and I mean it's almost crazy that they only won once right. yeah crazy as mm-hmm. good as they were 2010 y'all finally beat the Spurs you meet the Lakers you play against Kobe in game six and Kobe go crazy talk about that mm. that was, he was unbelievable in that game um you know it was it was uh I don't know that he had a great series until that game but I remember they won two games in LA thought we got a terrible whistle we came back to Phoenix and, and won, hand, won easily. Then mm-hmm. we come back to L.A. 2-2, and that's the game. We, we came flying back, tied the game with, like, 
couple seconds left, had all the momentum, and then Kobe missed a game winner, air ball, and uh, Ron Artest ran in and caught the ball like around his waist and flipped it up off the glass. Yeah. W- wins, <laughs> wins the game. And, you know, like, oh, man, that was like another slap in the face for me. Just thinking, That was game like, five, right? Game five. Um, just thinking, like, you know, we get Kobe Bryant to miss the basket completely. You know, we have all the momentum, and we give up, like, a crazy offensive rebound, toss it up high off the glass. So we go back home, um, you know, down 3-2, and Kobe has a, has a classic. You know, he's making everything, making deep, deep threes with Grant Hill all in his face. Uh, he was just, he was totally on fire and uh, had a great game and, and deserved to close it out. Mm, 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 mm. The summer of 2010, um, did you guys think... That was your guys' last run with Lamar. Did you think, had you had conversations with them? Did you think he was going to leave? Was there a chance? Did he say he was staying? Yeah. What was that like? I thought he was going to leave. You know, our ownership group was was adverse to going over the salary cap. They also, I think, were scared to give Amari, you know, with the troubles he'd have with his knee, um, both knees, I think, uh, the full, you know, the full max. And, and so I knew there was teams out there, the Knicks in particular, that were going to give him the max. So he would have to take a big pay cut, not only, I think, in salary, but also in, in length of years. So I thought it was pretty clear that there was a great chance he was going to go. And, uh, you know, that was it. That was the end of that kind of run, so to speak. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was an incredible run for me. Playing with Amari was one of the best partners I had and... and had so many incredible nights, you know, being able to play with him in transition or in pick and roll and, and had a lot of playoff success, never got to the finals, but we're close a number of times and uh, I'll never forget it. And that was, that was an incredibly fun time in my career. 2012, you're 36 years old and you're coming to LA to play mm-hmm. with Kobe. I, actually 30, I think I was 38. 38? Yeah, 38. Oh, old man, excuse me. Oh, 38. Old as, old as hell. 38, coming to L.A. <laughs> to play with Cole. Lakers signed Dwight. Um, talk to us about that time. Yeah, it was exciting. I mean, you know, the, the big, my first priority was I was going through a divorce. So I wanted to come to L.A. over Toronto and New York, the other two options, because it, it was close to Phoenix. And I, it was so much uncertainty, you know, going through that period. So that was, you know, the number one reason. But then to be able to join forces with those players, uh, obviously thought we had a championship opportunity and uh, couldn't have been more wrong or gone more sideways. But uh, coming here, I was excited. Um, I I actually, I think, made my last All-Star game that season at 38 before I came to the Lakers. So I still believed I could have a big impact, you know. And I don't know how much of it was... You know, I was losing a step or how much of it was me breaking my knee at the start of that season, breaking my tip fib joint. Uh, I know I was never the same after after I fractured my knee. Um, but the whole thing, you know, Dwight was coming off back surgery. Um, I, know, think, I think he rushed special. back. I think yeah. he rushed back because yeah, I had what? Dwight in, in Orlando. And when I tell you I've never played with a more security blanket in my life, mm. he was incredible. And, and, mm. and it hurt me because I knew, you know, when you come to Lakers, you, you can contest to it. It's just a different aura. You're expected mm. to win. You're expected to be your best. There's no excuses. Fuck everything else. You're a Laker, so yeah, nothing else sure. matters. So him coming back, rushing back, I personally knew that he wasn't ready. But I think you alluded to something, too, that people don't think about in the process, in the mental preparation, the mental toughness. You're going through a divorce. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you're still trying to put yourself in a position where uncertainty, I still want to be able to see my kids. I don't want to move mm-hmm. too far away. Talk, without getting too far into your personal life, talk to us about that because people don't see that side of athletes and realize how important other stuff in our life is when it pertains mm-hmm. to our, 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 our craft and our profession. Yeah, I mean, I think anyone could, you know, if you took a second to examine that, how, how difficult that would be. Um, you know, I was like, I would fly back sometimes after practice to go to my, well, how old would the girls have been? They must have been like eight, nine years old, go back for a soccer practice and fly back after it. You know, right. like just, just, just to, to see, just to see just them. To, just to see them, to get those touches in, mm-hmm. so to speak. Um, and get through that school year. You know, they moved to L.A. after the school year. But, um, yeah, I mean, it adds to it, right? It adds to everything. And maybe at that stage of my career, the stress didn't help when I'm trying to, you know, 
overcome so many things. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was it just wasn't meant to be. And I, I put I, I've never worked as hard in my life as I did for those two years trying to make it happen, trying to contribute, trying to be near uh, my best or at a level that I could really contribute. And, and it was an exciting prospect. And in the end, it was a disaster, but still a great experience. I got like so many times when you go through difficult times, you know, it's tough in the moment. But when you get through the other side, you realize that you learn a lot. You were challenged. You grow. Oh, man. So it allows much. you to handle the next things that come in life. So uh, it, was a, it was incredible to get a chance to play for the Laker organization, to, to meet all the people and that are, are, have been a part of that for so many years. Um, and I, so I take a lot of positives from it, regardless of all the negatives. When did you start to explore cannabis during this process? Uh, you know what, my... You said cannabis, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, I thought you said. I wasn't sure if you said Canada. I was like, oh, no, I <laughs> well, from the jump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know what? I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a. I'm, I was never really a smoker, but um, you know, I, I, the indica has really helped me sleep. I don't know if you guys use indica for sleep, but uh, I uh, use that, it for life. Yeah, that man. Like, <laughs> I, honestly, if it was, if it, if I didn't, I wasn't aware of it uh, during my career. But sleeping was always a problem for me, and it's the number one way to recover. Um, I really wish, you know, it could have helped me perform to have, you know, that sleep agent that isn't, you know, as, as kind of gnarly as like the sleep pills that I refuse to man, take because the, the right. impact they have on your body. Um, mm -hmm. so, so really I've, I've, I've been using that since I retired and it's given, it's improved my life. Like I sleep better. Yeah. Um, I, you know, have more reserves to be a dad of five kids, um, and do all the things that I want to continue doing. So right. that's kind of, that's kind of the extent of it for me. What, well, what are your thoughts on cannabis to the betterment in professional sports, like you said, to recover, to sleep, to, to do all the things you didn't know at the time it was helping with. Because I had a conversation, not to uh, you know, to go in the other direction, with Steve Kerr when I was with the Warriors the last year I won a championship, and he had the uh, those back problems, mm -hmm. the uh, the spine problems, and 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 we had a conversation about it. Oddly enough, a player talking to his coach, but. He couldn't do, he couldn't, you know, he was just in a horrible position and, and, and was telling me that, you know, some of the CBD stuff and the THC stuff he was using was really working. I'm just like, wow, you know, me being, you know, Jack too, someone who smoked cannabis since I was 14, I loved seeing that there was finally medical research and studies to prove what we already knew and would make yeah. other people more willing to give it a try. You know what yeah, I mean? I mean and, yeah. and you were one of them. Yeah, I mean, the proof's in the pudding, right? Like, it's becoming legalized. So we, we know enough, we're educated enough now to know that it's not like this stigma that needs to follow it around. Um, there are so many purposes and packages that uh, allow it to, to help many, many people. So I think it's, it's just one of those uh, parts of, of evolution in society that we're gaining. And, and I think within time, it'll be a, a much more mainstream and common thing in all people's walks of lives, especially those of professional athletes. So um, you play with a lot, of, a, great, a, lot of, a lot of players, a lot of great players. If there was one player that you could play with that you didn't play with, who would it be? Mm. Um, I mean, it's interesting because uh, Jordan was my hero, so you'd love to, to say you could play with Jordan. But... You know, also, you know, the other players of our era that I competed against, you know, I don't really feel like necessarily like I wanted to play with them because I always felt like we were competing against them. Um, mm, I but love like, that. You, but you can imagine, though, like the what it would be like, especially in that era to play with, you know, a great big, like, a, you know, not 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 that Amari Tim wasn't. You Tim and Tim Duncan. Duncan. Tim, Tim Duncan, Kevin, Kevin Garnett, um, those guys. Amari was more like of this mobile, like big forward. Uh, and he was incredible in the pick and roll. Those guys were more of those like, they owned the game under the basket at both ends. And uh, so mm -hmm. that, those, those guys would be incredible, especially in that era, you know, where like a rim protector was just like so invaluable. So important. You know, yeah. the way the game was played. Uh, favorite uh, point guard to go to battle against? Hmm. Uh, has had some great battles with Jay Kidd. You know, that's mm. kind of my era. Uh, you know, he, he was somebody that I think uh, I really admired his, you know, the way he played the game and, and how special a player he was. So, 
uh, that was he was one of my one of my favorites. So let me ask you this: music. What you listening to? What you what you Man. what you got on repeat right now? Um, you know it's so funny. Like with five kids, like. Uh, <laughs> It's like, <laughs> like I, I'm like, when do I listen to music anymore? Um, unfortunately, yeah. so you know, you end up listening. My daughters love Harry Styles. Like that was the last concert I went to with my. Yeah. You know what I mean? Harry it's like, with the girls. It's like it's like uh, <laughs> it, it, it's um it's crazy. So I still try to like, you know, move. Music still moves you, and it's always cool to hear good good music. But I, I it's like crazy how in having two little babies, the last three years uh like music has just fallen out like, the window is, I, I just yeah, think you know, you know, there's nothing new it's 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 kind of sad hopefully i'll get back to it one day you've been name dropped uh, by a lot of artists i know i've been i've been lucky, le lucky legendary status <laughs> hey, real quick i wanted to touch on real quick you said you, you're consulting for the warriors me being mm -hmm. there that one year I was just fucking blown away about the workouts you would put Steph and KD through. But to see KD doing what Steph did at seven feet and the mm. balance and the spinning and all the shit you had him going through, it was just a, a, I used to enjoy at the end of practice sitting and watching that. Talk to me a little bit, just a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think like when, when I, I don't know, coach, teach, whatever you want to call it, guys, you know, I, I, I always try to start first with movement, like, being on balance, moving correctly, um, because I think that if you're moving well and you're moving in the right way um, and you have the mobility, stability, and the dynamic movements that and if you get as, as close to your potential in those areas, your skill can take off and your skill can take over. Mm -hmm. You know, if the, if you start cutting corners on the way you move, you know, you negate, I think, your, your skill and your ability to to make plays at your potential. So Kevin is just, you know, like most of the greats, they move really, really well, and he's just a freak in that he's 6'10", mm. 6'11", whatever he is, and skilled and explosive and can control those long levers. I mean, I don't Limbs. know. Yeah, have we, ever, <laughs> have we ever seen someone that's like that explosive and that no. controlled, but at that length, um and accuracy so you know he's, he's special obviously and uh it was it was fun to work with him it was it like i said it what would blow me away was it, it, you're it, you're not teaching guard movement but you're teaching mm -hmm. balance and all that kind of stuff so you see steph at six three doing it and then you see katie right next to him at seven foot mm -hmm. doing the exact same thing and i'm just like god this is it's, insane it is it's it, it, it really is crazy um He's, you know, let's let's hope we get the best KD back after this because uh, he really is a beautiful basketball player and moves so well for someone with such long levers. Absolutely. Last question of the day. Rank these three players for me, in your opinion, MJ, Kobe, LeBron. Uh, it's tricky. You know, I think MJ's my guy for sure, always. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about LeBron and Kobe, like, I, I totally understand why people have LeBron where he is, either first or second in many people's eyes. You know, um, it, when you t look at the whole picture of everything uh, LeBron's done over the course of his career, it's hard to argue with. I think at his best, Kobe was right up there with any of them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he I, I don't know where the knock is, but, um, you know, he, he, when he was flying and playing at his best, you know, he, he was as good as we've ever seen. So, um I don't know. I think you probably you probably have me saying Jordan, LeBron, Kobe on the total pitcher, but um, I mean, how do you go wrong? At their best, they're, they're all Any three of them. At at their best, all three of them have played the game at a at a level higher than uh, you know anyone all else of us. in the world. Anyone. Right. <laughs> right. right. Back. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Hey, man, that's a wrap, Steve. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Thanks, um, big all bro. The, all the smoke. Uh, you can catch us on Showtime Basketball YouTube and all platforms streaming podcasts. All of them. There's something about how this place forms a different kind of person. On my high school team, we had five guys make the NBA.
We had the county rocking. You mentioned Prince George's County. People know what it's about. It's the mecca of basketball. There are those who come before us upon whose shoulders we stand. Being from this area, you have to have tough skin. The gym became his sanctuary. PG County guy. Provide buckets for America. You take it like too serious. Prince George packs a lot of power, a lot of character. I don't really think that they hear us. It's nothing that you can do to stop that competitive edge. We're pushing the community and the culture forward. It's just in the water. This life was all I ever wanted. I'm not leaving. Not yet. I was hoping you'd say that. We gotta hit the streets, make some money. People like us must destroy people like him. Get Showtime free at Showtime.com.